Thank you very much, David, for those extremely uh, generous words of introduction. And it is a great pleasure and a great honor to be here uh, in Birmingham. I was just thinking um, a couple of days ago when I was putting the finishing touches to this talk, when was the last time I gave a lecture in Birmingham? And it was, I looked it up, it was actually in 1995 when I gave something called the Huxley Lecture in the School of Biology. I can't remember exactly what I talked about. It was probably, though, about my uh, research on spatial memory in birds. I do remember that, uh, rather embarrassingly, after about two minutes, somebody fell asleep and started snoring very loudly. Uh, and I did sort of gesticulate to the person next to uh, the sleeper, snorer, uh, could you wake him up? And the answer shouted out, you put him to sleep, you wake him up. <laughs> Um, anyway, so uh, I hope I don't have to repeat that today. Um, since that time, uh, as David has uh, indicated in his, his introduction, my life changed. I moved from being uh, a purely a research scientist uh, to moving over to what some people might see as the darker side of life, uh, working at the interface between uh, science and policy. And. Uh, I'm going to share some thoughts with you about my experiences, by no means all my experiences, but some of them, in the various roles that, that David uh, has referred to. And um, what I'm going to do is start off by uh, illustrating a question that I often get asked by my academic colleagues who look on with some, uh, I don't know, dismay or anxiety about the fact that I left the uh, relatively straightforward world of the laboratory to operate in this more complicated environment. And the question that I have been asked many times is, well, isn't it rather annoying when uh, government ministers ignore scientific advice? Uh, and uh, my response is that there's no straightforward answer to that because you can answer uh, yes or no. There are many occasions when... Um, the government, uh, whether uh, officials or ministers, do follow scientific advice very rigorously, and there are other occasions when they don't. Um, and it's not that there's any shortage of scientific advice for the government. Uh, there are over 70 scientific advisory committees that have a statutory role in advising the government. Uh, more or less all of the 17 departments of state have a departmental chief scientific advisor. There's a government chief scientific advisor, a chief medical officer, and so on. Uh, so we are well equipped with scientific advice. Um, and there are examples where that advice is, is being followed. And I want to um, talk about one just as an illustration in a bit of detail. Some of you who were uh, around in the first years of this century in 2001 will recall the dreadful epidemic of foot and mouth disease. And uh, these are images from the press at the time of uh, tens of thousands of livestock, sheep, uh, pigs, and cattle being burned in funeral pyres after they'd been slaughtered. Uh, and I want to tell you a little bit about the scientific story behind that, because the outbreak started in February 2001 uh, at a, a pig farm in Northumbria. And for the first few weeks, in sort of middle of February through the middle of March, or early part of March, the government's line, Ministry of Agriculture, Fisheries and Food, as it was then, was that this epidemic was well under control. And the then Minister Maff, uh, Nick Brown, and the chief vet, Jim Scudamore, appeared regularly on television to say nothing to, to be concerned about. We've got, uh, we've got our hands on this. Uh, I wondered at the time uh, how, they, how they actually could justify that, how they knew, particularly because foot and mouth disease uh, is spread by sheep as well as cattle, and it's difficult to detect in sheep because they're roaming around on the hillsides, and sheep are transported around the country in large numbers. They're traded as a commodity. So uh, I thought uh, I would try and look into it. I was then head of the Food Standards Agency. I should emphasize that foot and mouth disease was not a food safety issue, but it could affect uh, the supply chain, uh, the food supply chain, so it was a food issue. And so what I did was to, uh, without asking anybody about it, I called together a group of experts, mathematical modelers who work on the spread of infectious disease from Imperial College, Cambridge, Edinburgh, and Warwick. And I said, could you, if I got you the data, uh, figure out what's going on here? And they said what they, they could, but what they'd need 
was a farm-by-farm -farm analysis of how the disease was spreading. So I rang up the permanent secretary in MAF, Sir Brian Bender, and I said, uh, uh, could I have this data? And he said, well, it's nothing to do with you, it's to do with MAF. And there was a bit of a, a frank exchange of views, and eventually he did give me the data, and the modelers went away and they came back a couple of weeks later. And what they told us, and us by then was an assembly of officials from MAF, the government's chief scientist, uh, Sir David King, and myself, uh, was jaw-dropping. They said, if from the mathematical modeling of the spread of this disease, the doubling time for the number of farms affected was 12 days. And this was now late March, and if that 12-day doubling time continued, within six weeks, more than half the livestock farms in England would have, in Britain, would have succumbed to foot and mouth disease. And that was an absolutely draw-droppingly different conclusion from the one that MAF was promulgating that, um, that the disease was under control. Uh, as a result of that, uh, that was the end of my part of the, uh, my role in the story, basically, because Dave King, uh, the government's chief scientific advisor, uh, went to talk to the Prime Minister, and the Prime Minister said, this has now got to be uh, driven, the policy has got to be driven through scientific advice, and Dave King and the group of modelers that I'd brought together generated the policy advice that was translated directly into the government's policy for trying to get a grip on this epidemic. And the, as you'll probably remember, and this is what these images partly reflect, the, the epidemiologists said the only way to contain the disease, apart from restricting movement of animals, is to uh, create a cordon sanitaire uh, around affected areas by uh, killing and slaughtering the, the livestock. Um, I do remember attending, uh, as an advisor, uh, a cabinet meeting at which this, um, uh, this uh, whole question was discussed. And uh, there was a, the, the, the question under issue was, in addition to banning the movement of livestock, what about sporting events like horse races and so on that uh, uh, use animals? Should they be banned? And uh, David Blunkett, who was sitting directly opposite the Prime Minister, suddenly said, well, uh, if you're going to ban uh, that, that sort of thing, that'll uh, stop all of Sheffield Wednesday's games. And uh, the Prime Minister said, why? And he said, because there are a load of donkeys. Um, <laughs> anyway, um, so... Um, there is just one further twist to this story, which is about vaccination. Uh, people uh, said, well, why didn't, instead of killing all these animals, why didn't we just vaccinate them? Because there is an effective vaccine against the foot and mouth virus. And the answer was that the food industry it wasn't a political decision by the uh, ministers and politicians. It was a decision uh, pressed by the food industry. And the, partly the producers of dairy products said, well, if we start vaccinating animals, we won't be able to export any dairy products because in theory, they could still export, or in fact, they couldn't because of the foot and mouth epidemic. But once uh, and, and individuals are vaccinated, they would not, there was a, a European agreement that they wouldn't be allowed to export uh, uh, products from vaccinated animals. Uh, but also the retailers were very concerned that uh, this would scare people, uh, you know, frightened of the fact that this is from vaccinated animals, even though I pointed out that the average cow is vaccinated, a dairy cow is vaccinated against about 30 different diseases. Uh, so this would be nothing out of the ordinary. Uh, and the Prime Minister did try to persuade the food industry in a meeting at uh, Chequers to, to accept vaccination, but he failed, and hence that policy, although uh, there was clear scientific advice that the government would have accepted, wasn't implemented. So there's a story of how uh, science translated very directly into policy, and it's by no means the only one. If you remember much more recently, in fact, in uh, May 2010, the Icelandic volcano with the unpronounceable name, Eyjafjallajökull, uh, Jokuch, uh, uh, erupted, and I happened to be in New York at the time, and I was stranded in New York because of the ash cloud. And uh, the question was, when would it be safe to resume uh, flights? And that was uh, very much that decision was taken on the basis of uh, scientific advice led by the then chief scientific advisor, Sir John Beddington. Uh, equally, a year later, when uh, the uh, nuclear power plant at Fukushima in Japan uh, was damaged in the tsunami, and there was a question, what should the advice be to uh, British residents living in, in Japan, particularly in Tokyo. Uh, 
Uh, most of the other European governments uh, uh, told their officials and businessmen to get out quickly. Uh, instead, uh, our government asked Sir John Beddington, the chief scientific advisor, to set up an expert group to assess the risks. And he said very clearly the amount of radiation that you would be exposed to uh, living in Tokyo was uh, rather less than you would be exposed to by flying away from Tokyo, because if you fly uh, on a 10-hour flight, you're exposed to a significant amount of radiation uh, from, uh, from the atmosphere. So our uh, national advice was very different from that of other countries. It was scientifically based. Um, as a consequence, uh, John Beddington was awarded uh, a sort of very high-powered gong, a bit like a knighthood by the Japanese government, because uh, he was the one who led, and our government was the one who led, the voice of reason, the voice of evidence in the face of, of panic. Uh, well, you might say, well, those are emergencies, and clearly when the chips are down, uh, ministers are looking for any help they can get, and if scientists step up to the plate, then all are good for them. But also, one can point to areas of long-term policy uh, where science has driven the agenda. And I'm going to talk a little bit later on about the Climate Change Act 2008, which set out the UK's response to the challenge of climate change. And the acceptance of that act, which was supported by all parties when it went through Parliament in 2007, uh, was based, the acceptance of that was based on uh, the very strong consensus among the uh, scientific community of climate modelers uh, that uh, hum human greenhouse gas emissions have contributed to climate change and that this could be a very severe problem for the future if we didn't take action. So there are some positive stories. Um, but you may then say, well, what about the other side of the coin? I mean, there are lots of uh, cases where the government has appeared to trample over scientific advice when the advice has been too inconvenient. Uh, take, for example, alcohol. Uh, there's no doubt amongst the experts, uh, uh, and this has been voiced, among others, by two successive chief medical officers, Sir Liam Donaldson and Dame Sally Davis, that a minimum price of 50 pence per unit of alcohol would be an effective policy measure to curb excessive drinking. It's not going to solve the problem, but it would have an effect because of the uh, demand uh, curve in relation to price. But the government has so far refused, in England, has refused to implement this policy. Uh, in spite of the fact that according to the cabinet officer's own figures, uh, excessive alcohol consumption costs the country over 15 billion pounds a year, and perhaps even more importantly, it's estimated by the Cabinet Office that over a million children a year are adversely affected by the byproduct consequences of excessive alcohol consumption, not because they're consuming it themselves, but because they're living in households where parents are uh, getting too drunk and uh, abusing or otherwise badly treating their children. So why hasn't the government accepted uh, the advice, clear cut? Well, they haven't said, but one can suspect that a powerful drinks industry has lobbied very hard to persuade ministers that a 50p minimum uh, price per unit of alcohol would hit the responsible drinker. In other words, it would hit sales. What about homeopathy? The National Health Service uh, provides homeopathic treatments using taxpayers' money, even though no scientific study has ever shown any benefit beyond that of a placebo of homeopathic medicines. We don't know exactly how much money is spent on homeopathy by the NHS, but there are four homeopathic hospitals in the UK, so we're talking about many millions of pounds a year that could be spent otherwise on treatments that actually work. Um, when uh, the Select Committee on Science and Technology and the Lords that I chaired until uh, June asked the uh, Lords Health Minister why his department spent money on homeopathy, he had at least got the honesty to say, well, we know it doesn't work, but there is a, a legitimate case for meeting public demand. Uh, <laughs> what, about, what about drugs? Uh, you probably know the, the uh, by now infamous story uh, of the Advisory Committee on the Misuse of Drugs, ACMD, which has a statutory job of assessing the risks and harms of different forms of drugs and advising on their classification, which in turn uh, determines the penalties for their possession. So there's A, B, and C are the three levels of, uh, of illegal drugs. And in July uh, 2008, the Prime Minister and the Home Secretary asked ACMD, then chaired by Sir Michael Rawlins, to advise on the classification of cannabis. Uh, 
However, uh, Gordon Brown, the Prime Minister, stated in public before the expert and scientific advice had, uh, had been re uh, 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 delivered to him that he uh, concluded that uh, cannabis should be reclassified from C up to B. And uh, Mike Rawlins actually had to write to him to say, please wait for the advice before you reach your conclusion. And in the advice, uh, Sir Michael set out uh, very clearly, he said, and I quote, after the most careful scrutiny of the totality of available evidence, the majority of the council's members consider, based on its harmfulness to individuals and society, that cannabis should remain a class C substance. Equally controversial was the Home Secretary Jackie Smith's response uh, to ecstasy. And she said, before having asked the ACMD for advice, um, we have no intention to reclassify ecstasy, and it is my view that it should remain at class A. And in the same letter to Sir John Bedding, she says, I have not yet received ACMD's advice. So her personal opinion clearly trumped that of the expert analysis of the statutory uh, committee. Now, um, I, and of course, as you, I'm sure you know, that uh, Sir Mike Rawlins' successor to, as the chair of the Advisory Committee on the Misuse of Drugs, Professor David Nutt, who was very outspoken in his uh, comments on the inappropriateness of the government's position on uh, some of these drugs, was then sacked by the um, Minister for Health, the Secretary of State for Health, Alan Johnson. Um, sometimes uh, ministers draw opposite conclusion from exactly the same piece of scientific evidence. And I want to again turn to a story that I've been involved in, which is the control of bovine tuberculosis in cattle. Now, according to, um, sorry, that was drugs. Sorry, gone past the drugs. Uh, this was actually taken from, uh, I think it's the Birmingham Post. I found a, a, a sort of local color I thought would work well. Um, it was a story about the number of illegal cannabis farms in this part of the world. You're obviously having a really good time here. Um, but um, switching now to bovine TB, according to DEFRA, the Department for Environment, Food and Rural Affairs, bovine tuberculosis is one of the biggest challenges for the UK cattle industry. In 2012, which are the last figures I could find on the government's website, 5,000 new herds were affected, 37,000 cattle were slaughtered because they had bovine TB, and the cost to the taxpayer was about 100 million pounds. And the problem is getting worse. Um, here we are, this, uh, two maps of, uh, of uh, the United Kingdom. On the left is 1986, and there are a few red dots, which are farms with bovine TB. On the right is 2009, and there are a great cloud of red dots in the southwest, the West Midlands, and South Wales. And that reflects the increase in that period between uh, 1986 and 2009 in the incidence of bovine tuberculosis. It's getting worse and worse. I came into this story back in 1996 when I was asked by the then uh, head of the Ministry of Agriculture, Douglas Hogg, if I would examine the scientific evidence uh, about the spread of bovine TB. And particularly, there was an interest in, which you probably have heard of before, the relationship between TB in cattle and TB in badgers, because badgers are a wildlife reservoir. And I conducted a review, which I handed in actually to uh, Douglas Hodd's successor. There'd been a general election in the meantime, so his successor was, was Jack Cunningham as Minister Maff. And my report concluded that badgers are indeed part of the problem. They do carry the disease and they do transmit it to cattle. But the question I couldn't answer, which is what I was asked to answer, was would getting rid of badgers help to control the disease in cattle? And I gave uh, an honest answer, which was, we don't know, but I can tell you how to find out. And the answer was, you need to do a really big field experiment. And to uh, the credit of uh, the uh, department at that time, they accepted that advice and they set out to do what is probably the largest ecological experiment ever conducted in this country, called the Randomized Badger Culling Trial, or sometimes, unfortunately for me, called the Krebs Trials. And, um, just to give you a sense of scale, uh, this trial consisted of three different treatments. Treatment A was not to remove any badgers at all. Treatment B, called reactive culling, was to remove badgers from an area once there had been an outbreak of TB in a farm. And the treatment C was to 
try to get rid of the badgers over a large area before there'd been an outbreak of TB. So that was called proactive culling. And these uh, circles and filled, filled and open circles represent the 10 areas in the southwest and the West Midlands where these uh, three treatments were uh, located. And each of the three treatments was replicated 10 times. And each replicate for each treatment was an area of 100 square kilometers. So this is uh, an experiment that covered 30,000 square kilometers of the southwest of England, West Midlands. So a very large experiment. The results were quite unexpected. Um, I had thought in writing the report and making the recommendation that a plausible policy option would be the reactive culling policy, get rid of badgers once there's been an outbreak of, of, of TB in, in farms. It turned out that reactive culling actually made things worse. Uh, but proactive culling, that is the uh, policy of going in and trying to remove as many badgers as possible over this whole 100 square uh, kilometer uh, area, uh, did make things better, but not by very much and not, by, not very rapidly. After many years of uh, heavy culling, uh, there was a modest reduction in the amount of TB in cattle. But that modest reduction was actually slightly peculiar because in the core of each of these 100 square kilometer areas, there was about a 30% reduction in TB in cattle, but around the edge in the penumbra, there was actually an increase in the amount of TB in cattle. And in order to understand that, you have to understand badger behavior. This is really the key to this. Badgers are highly territorial, they live in group territories, and when you start removing them, you break down the territorial system and new migrant badgers that are wandering around and are often the sick and infected badgers that don't have a territory move into these areas and bring new disease. And that's what so-called perturbation effect that produced this peculiarity of an increase around the penumbra of these uh, removal areas. And the net benefit, the net benefit taking into account the 30% the reduction inside the core and the increase outside, the net benefit after nine years was about a 16% saving in TB in, in cattle. Um, so the scientific advisors who oversaw this, because I'd handed it on to uh, another group, uh, they concluded that uh, the scientific evidence didn't support culling as an effective or cost-effective policy for tackling the problem of TB in cattle. Uh, the experiment isn't clean and crisp as a white lab coat. It's rough and ready as a field experiment would be, but it's about as good as it could get. Um, when Hillary Benn was Secretary of State, by now for the Environment, Department of Environment, Food and Rural Affairs, he looked at the evidence and he concluded that killing badgers wasn't the answer. Um, on the other hand, in May 2010, when, and this I'm not making a part of a little point here, I hasten to add, when the, uh, the government changed, they came in and said, no, we think that uh, killing badgers is the answer. And I uh, confronted Jim Pace, now Sir Jim Pace, the food and farming minister, and I said, well, which bit of science has changed in the last month? And he found it difficult to uh, articulate clearly which bit of science it was. Um, but nevertheless, that's what's happened. So this is just a, a space filler. This is a very nice uh, fresco from uh, uh, um, a monastery near Siena called Monte Oliveto. It's by an Italian artist called Giovanni Bazzi, uh, who's called, uh, lo locally called Il Sodoma for particular reasons about his behavior. Uh, but, um, and he was very keen on badgers. That's why I'm showing it. Um, <laughs> uh, he's got pet badgers there. Uh, so what's happening now, uh, uh, in fact, the policy is in, in disarray. What the, and I emphasize this is not a part of a political point, this is a, a scientific point. Uh, the, the present government wanted to uh, adopt the policy of killing badgers to control the disease, but they wanted to, in effect, privatize it by getting the farmers to pay and to take responsibility for killing the badgers on their own land. So uh, farmers agreed to pay for hiring guns to shoot badgers on their land. In the randomized badger culling trial, badgers were cage trapped and shot rather than free shooting. So this was trying out a new approach to killing badgers. And they decided, the government decided to try this out in two areas, in uh, Somerset and Gloucestershire. And they tried it out last year. Uh, they made the mistake of setting up an independent scientific panel to comment on these uh, pilots in the two areas. 
And that was a mistake because the independent panel reported um, last spring and said uh, the pilots uh, have failed miserably. They failed to uh, get rid of the target number of badgers. They failed to meet the criterion of humaneness because with free shooting, you could imagine sort of badgers limping around the countryside having been shot in the leg. So the criterion that the government set was that uh, 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 more than 95% of the badgers had to die within five minutes of being shot. So the independent expert panel said, uh, no, these trials have failed. And there was another thing, you may remember the Secretary of State, uh, uh, then Secretary of State, Owen Patterson, talking about the badgers moving the goalposts, and that was because the number of badgers in the area kept on changing as they, the, the different estimates were done. So it was a mess. And you might think that the sensible thing to do, based on the scientific advice, we would say, well, we tried it out, it didn't work, now let's look at something else. But actually, what's happened is uh, the department decided to carry on with the same thing again this year, and we'll see what happens in the next, uh, it's being done at this very moment as we speak, uh, we'll see what happens. But if culling isn't the answer, what would be the answer? Well, the best scientific analysis, actually carried out by Matt Keeling at the University of Warwick and others, shows that the way to control this disease in cattle is to bear down on cattle movements and to improve the test. So the way, what happens at the moment is that farms in high risk areas, like you showed in the map, the Southwest and the West Midlands, the farm, cattle farms are tested on a regular basis. But the test is unfortunately rather unreliable, so it quite often misses uh, animals that have got TB. So getting a more sensitive test is a crucial priority. But also what happens, it turns out, when you look at the data on a farm by farm basis, a small number of farms are responsible for a large amount of the spread of the disease and probably certain farmers are busy trading infected cattle. So if they suspect their cattle are infected, they move them on, sell them in the cattle market and move them on to somebody else's farm. Or it may be just by accident because the test is insufficiently accurate. So there is a scientific, uh, potential scientific answer, but it's not the one that the current government is pursuing. So what should we conclude from these stories? Does it mean that uh, politicians are fickle, that they're cherry picking advice that suits them and ditching it when it doesn't? Uh, not necessarily, because I think we have to acknowledge, us people who are involved in the business of scientific advice, that it's only one strand in the fabric of decision making. There are lots of other factors. Public perception, which is what Jackie Smith appealed to in relation to drugs. Uh, it could be to do with the impacts on the economy. That might well be a reason for not uh, reducing the, uh, or introducing a minimum price for alcohol. Uh, it may affect jobs in the drinks industry, um, or other other considerations, and that's perfectly valid as long, as long as the decision makers are prepared to say, we know we're going against the scientific evidence, but here's why. And that will be, you know, that's a perfectly acceptable answer. Uh, but I just want to, how am I doing on the time? Yeah, I'm okay. I want to briefly, having been a bit critical of politicians, I want to now turn the tables and be a bit critical of, of scientists, of which I'm one. Uh, we must remember that scientists can get it wrong too, and I just want to give you uh, a few examples. And starting uh, a bit further back in history, this is uh, Lord Lister, the uh, uh, discoverer of uh, antiseptics, who uh, chaired a commission of inquiry for the Royal Society in the late 19th century, which concluded, and I quote, neither lime juice nor fresh vegetables either prevent scurvy or treat it. Scurvy is a disease produced by eating tainted food. Quite extraordinary given that 150 years earlier, a Scottish surgeon named James Lind had carried out controlled experiments to show that citrus fruit does uh, prevent scurvy and, treat and cure it. And the Navy had been treating sailors by giving them lime juice laced with rum for nearly 100 years. Uh, so quite extraordinary, here's a distinguished scientist chairing a distinguished group of scientific experts reaching a completely wrong conclusion. We now know this was bizarre, bizarrely wrong. Another example from uh, the slightly more recent past, which I'm sure you're familiar with, uh, recently C.P. Snow's Godkin lectures were republished in which he describes how Churchill's scientific advisor, F.A. Lindemann, shown here later Lord Charwell, gave Churchill two really misleading pieces of scientific advice. The first was uh, not to invest in the development of radar, uh, 
Uh, but luckily, uh, Churchill was an opposition politician at that point in the mid-1930s, so that piece of advice uh, wasn't implemented, and we did go on to develop radar uh, thanks to the advice of Sir Henry Tizard, which helped uh, crucially in the, in the Battle of Britain. But the second piece of advice that Lindemann is famous for, he calculated that carpet bombing of German working-class housing would end the war quickly, and this was the policy adopted then by Churchill, although it subsequently turned out that Lindemann's estimates were at least an order of magnitude too high, the estimates of the impact. So it was very misleading and very damaging scientific advice in terms of the impact on the civilian population of Germany. Much more recently, uh, in fact, when I started as uh, head of the Food Standards Agency, the big issue in food safety was mad cow disease, BSE. And the experts had modeled the spread of the disease, and they had estimated that uh, as many as half a million people in this country would contract human BSE, mad cow disease, and would die of it because there's no cure for it. So you can imagine I started off as head of the Food Standards Agency with this looming threat. Um, in fact, it's turned out that fewer than 200 people, each one a tragedy, uh, has died of uh, human BSE, in spite of the fact that we, those of us who were around, ate more than a million infected cattle at the time. So wh why did the scientists get it so badly wrong? It was sheer good luck for us. It turns out uh, that we are much, much less susceptible to the infective agent, the prion protein from cattle, than our mice. And the modelers had quite reasonably said, if we know a certain dose from a cow would infect a mouse, which had been shown experimentally, and we scale that up for body size, we can then figure out the infective dose for humans. And that was a reasonable conclusion because cattle and mice are about as closely related as cattle and human. So the genetic evolutionary barrier should be comparable. But by sheer luck, it turns out that we're very resistant to the disease. So, of course, the fact that uh, scientists sometimes get it wrong uh, shouldn't be a surprise because scientific uh, knowledge is continually developing. And uh, at any one time, there'll be uh, certain areas in which understanding is very good. Like if I drop this, we know it's going to go down to the ground. We know about gravity. It's not going to float up to the ceiling. There are other areas where scientific understanding is, is still in a primitive state. So the questions to which policymakers need the answers may be in the category as with the badgers that I was asked to advise on, we don't know, or perhaps there are competing views. Just to give you an example of competing views, when Alan Michael was uh, a minister in, uh, in the Ministry of Agriculture, he asked two expert advisory groups to give him an assessment, a scientific assessment of the risk of the so-called bystander effect. This is when people live near uh, fields that are being sprayed with pesticides, and the pesticide drifts into their uh, garden or on the road, is that causing any harm to them? And pressure groups believe that hundreds of people in this country suffer from either chronic fatigue syndrome or multiple chemical sensitivity as a result of spray drift. Unfortunately for Alan Michael, the two groups he asked came to the opposite conclusion. The Royal Commission on Environmental Pollution concluded, and I quote, it's plausible that there could be a link between pesticide exposure and ill health, while the statutory advisory committee on pesticides concluded, and I quote, pesticide toxicity is unlikely to contribute importantly to chronic fatigue syndrome or multiple chemical sensitivity. So the two groups looked at the same evidence and came to different conclusions. They agreed there was uncertainty about the impacts, but they disagreed on uh, uh, how one should interpret that uncertainty. And I want to just say a little bit about uh, scientific uncertainty, because that is, although not unusual, in, in the scientific context is an opportunity for people to undermine scientific advice and scientific evidence. And if you haven't read it, I highly recommend this book uh, by uh, uh, a social scientist, Naomi Oreskes, called Merchants of Doubt, in which she describes what she calls the tobacco strategy. The tobacco industry prevented legislation to restrict access to tobacco, particularly in the United States, for many decades, through a series of lines of arguments. They said, and they argued persuasively to convince uh, decision makers, the scientific evidence isn't completely clear cut. And the concerns are therefore being exaggerated. You know, maybe tobacco doesn't cause cancer. And in any case, if there is a problem, we'll find a technological fix. Uh, 
and therefore there's no need to do anything. And that strategy has been applied in, not just in relation to smoking, but as she showed in this book, uh, on a number of other issues, acid rain, the ozone uh, hole in the stratosphere, and most recently in relation to climate change, in relation to global warming, about which I'll say uh, a little more in a moment. And what she, she says about it is that doubt works, and it works in part because of an erroneous view of science, namely that science produces certainty. So if we lack certainty, we think the science must be faulty or incomplete. And she goes on to say, research produces evidence which in time may settle the question. After that point, there are no sides. There's simply accepted scientific knowledge. There, there is the consensus of expert opinion on a particular matter. That is what scientific knowledge is. So uncertainty can be conflated with doubt and can be used to undermine scientific uh, evidence. Um, I want to turn now to... Um, back to the Climate Change Act, because climate change is an area, a current area, in which there are people who call themselves skeptics, I would call themselves, call them climate change deniers, who are using this doubt uncertainty trick to try and undermine uh, any legislation, any restrictions to do with meeting the challenge of climate change. Um, and you may have heard, in fact, the former Environment Secretary Owen Paterson on the Today programme uh, this morning at 20 to 8, arguing that the UK should ditch or suspend the 2008 Climate Change Act. What the Act does is to commit the UK to a legally binding target of reducing our greenhouse gas emissions to 80% below 1990 levels by 2050. And you may say, where does that target come from? Uh, it comes from uh, a global equity argument. Um, we, at the moment, we, all of us in this room, have a carbon footprint of about five times the global, ab global average. We're emitting 10 tonnes per person per year. Globally, the average is two tonnes per person per year. So if we got ourselves down to the global average, then we would have an 80% reduction. Uh, Owen Patterson doubts the importance of climate change, and he doubts the evidence. Uh, when he was Secretary of State, uh, I have a had a statutory role to advise him on climate change, but the DEFRA officials warned me very clearly never to mention the term climate change in meetings with him because he'd lose interest. So it was slightly surreal to have to advise on climate change but not mention the word um, <laughs> or the phrase. I'm not going to try and summarise all the evidence about uh, why there is a scientific consensus on climate change, why it's thought by all this, the world scientists who've looked at it through the International Panel on uh, Climate, Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, why it's thought to be real and why it's man-made largely and why it's one of the biggest single long-term threats to our future well-being. But my simple summary is, is really four points. Uh, gases such as carbon dioxide and methane act to warm the earth. We know that. The greenhouse effect was demonstrated experimentally 150 years ago by John Tyndall. The concentrations of these gases have gone up dramatically in the past 150 years. And we know from the isotopic signature, the chemical signature, that for carbon dioxide, for example, the way the gas has gone up is through a release from burning fossil fuels. We know that the temperature of the globe has gone up in the same period, and we know that models of the climate can only uh, simulate the uh, pattern of temperature change if they include man-made emissions. So I think the narrative is very, very convincing indeed. There's clearly some uncertainty about the timescale and the magnitude of climate change, but that's not the same as saying it's not happening. And it may not become an acute problem in my lifetime, but it certainly will during the lifetime of some of the younger members of uh, the audience and certainly during the lifetime of my grandchild. So I think we should do something about it, and the something uh, means reducing our car carbon footprint as rapidly as possible, as well, well as preparing for the inevitability of the climate change that we're already committed to as a result of the greenhouse gases we've pumped into the air over the last 150 years. And again, you may have heard on the Today programme Adair Turner, who used to chair the Climate Change Committee, which I'm a member of, who said that our national strategy is to decarbonise electricity supply and then run as much as we can off uh, electricity. Uh, at the same time, we need to do a great deal to change the way we conduct our lives, to better insulate our homes, to uh, drive less, instead uh, use public transport or cycle or walk, 
change our farming practices, and perhaps reduce our air travel. And these are very big asks, and uh, it's at least an open question as to whether we or our politicians will have the will to make these very radical changes. And there's also a question of what it will cost. And the Climate Change Committee estimates that if we did all of this, it would reduce our wealth by about 1% in 2050. So in January 2050, sorry, in June 2050, we would be about as rich as we would have been in January 2050 if GDP were growing at 2%. But I think there's a broader problem, and this is my last few minutes, is whether uh, meeting the environmental challenge of climate change and impact on natural resources, on forests, on biodiversity, on soils, is compatible with ever continuing economic growth. Here's a headline from the Daily Telegraph uh, in August. UK economy is a world beater. We grew in the second quarter at a rate of over 3%, better than US, Germany, France, Japan, and Italy. Great news, or is it? Here's what uh, Joe Stiglitz, a Nobel Prize winning economist, says in his book, Freefall. He says, politicians, policymakers, and economists all strive to under understand what causes better performance as measured by GDP. But if GDP growth is a bad measure of societal well being, then we are striving for the wrong objective. He goes on to point out if those in developing countries try to imitate America's lifestyle, the planet is doomed. There are not enough natural resources and the impact on, the, on global warming would be intolerable. One, another way of putting it, which I like to use, is that the, I said the average uh, um, global uh, footprint, carbon footprint, is two tons of carbon per person per year. The average American citizen has a global footprint of 20 tons of carbon per person per year. So if you could wave a magic wand and turn everybody in the world into a consumer uh, and producer of uh, greenhouse gases like a typical American, it would be like having 72 billion people on the planet tomorrow. And it's hard to imagine how the planet could sustain over 70 billion people. You'd have to be a real optimist to believe that that was uh, a possible end point. So, my final points really to, to ask are, are there alternatives to GDP, to thinking of economic growth as the answer for the future? Is, can we think about life in a different way? And if we are going to think about life in a different way, what would we have to do and can, can science help us? Uh, this was just to say that Robert Skidelsky's book makes a very similar point to, um, uh, to Joe Stiglitz, but I won't, uh, I won't uh, go into that in detail. Um, there are, of course, economists who think that we can have economic growth forever and meet all our environmental targets, uh, but I'm not going to go into that. I just uh, bear in mind uh, Bernard Shaw's quip that if all the economists were laid end to end, they would never reach a conclusion. Uh, I'm not an economist, but uh, my expert economist friends tell me that those who think that economic growth can carry on forever and ever do have to make some heroic assumptions. So... What are the alternatives? Well, one alternative would be to stop measuring ourselves by uh, growth in, in the economy, to think, or think of other ways of, of measuring our, our progress. And one possibility which has been suggested by uh, this report uh, called Sweating Our Assets, uh, produced by a group of, of, uh, of MPs, is that we should measure resource efficiency. How efficiently do we do use resources may be a better measure than how much uh, wealth do we push through the economy per person, because after all, GDP is a measure of flow of money through the economy. It's not about any true sense of us doing better. Uh, when the uh, big BP Gulf uh, of Mexico oil spill occurred, that increased the GDP of that part of the United States because a lot of money was spent cleaning up the, the oil spill. Um, but underlying all of that, however we look at this, is the problem of behavior change. How are we going to bring about in society a change of attitude? We've all been brought up, certainly my generation, to love consumption. We are, you know, cons consumption mad. We like stuff. You know, I've got, I can't where it is now, but I've got my iPhone with me. You've probably all got smartphones and iPads and things like that. We love consuming stuff. But if we're going to shift away from uh, perpetual growth and consumption, we all have to begin to think differently. And I think the problem of behavior change is one where science has not yet really produced good answers, but it is a hugely important one. 
And I just want, in the last few slides, to say uh, there are some sex successful examples of population-level behavior change. When I was an undergraduate and I went out with my mates to a country pub, the landlord would say before we left to get into our car, would you like to have one for the road? Um, <laughs> inconceivable that a landlord, well, maybe they do in this part of the country, but <laughs> it's pretty unlikely, I think. Uh, I can remember seatbelts being introduced and the clunk click every trip, trip um, uh, advert on television. Uh, and I can uh, remember when I was a kid, uh, most adult males smoked. In fact, in 1950, 70% uh, of adult males smoke, now it's uh, around 20%. There have been huge changes in our behavior, largely driven by legislation, but also by education, and in the case of tobacco, by taxation. Uh, so that's one answer, is to just regulate things. But are there more subtle ways of bringing about behavioral change? And of course, one place to look is the place I've already alluded to, the marketers who persuade us to buy stuff. And really the beginning of the science of marketing was at the, the start of the 20th century. And one of the first uh, geniuses of marketing science was this man, Claude Hopkins, who uh, in, in the early 20th century, hardly any people in the States uh, used toothpaste. In fact, uh, I think 7% of Americans had a tube of toothpaste. Uh, what he did was to invent a story that your teeth are covered in a cloudy film. And the cloudy film is really nasty. It's no, no cloudy film actually exists, but he made up the concept. And if you use Pepsodent toothpaste, you could get rid of the cloudy film and have a gorgeous smile like the woman on the right-hand side of the picture. And through that alone, uh, the, the number of people using toothpaste increased by about tenfold um, in the space of 10 years. So it was a massive success of marketing. And of course, all the things that we buy today that I alluded to exploit our fears and weaknesses to make us change our behavior. We feel we can't manage without uh, uh, an iPad or uh, an iPod or a smartphone. So there is a fashion amongst policymakers to try and draw on these insights in, into the psychology of the human to try and bring about changes in behavior. And there's a team called the Behavioral Insights Team in the Cabinet Office whose job it is to try and understand the human psychology and see what can be done. And they have had some modest successes. If you uh, send people a reminder to relicense their car uh, and you include in the reminder letter a photograph of their car with the out-of-date license uh, disc, uh, they, they're three times as likely to rush off and relicense their car. And here in Birmingham, uh, Frank Eves, who's uh, one of the academics here at the university, has shown that you can double the number of uh, overweight people using stairs instead of an escalator at a tram station simply by putting a sign at the bottom of the stairs saying, regular stair helping help, helps to prevent weight gain. And at the top of the stairs, you put a sign saying, uh, uh, well done, stair climbers, you've just turned, uh, burned off 16% of the calories needed to prevent weight gain. I have to say, when I arrived at Birmingham New Street uh, at uh, quarter to five, I found that the, things have moved on since Frank's research because the up escalator from the platforms wasn't working, so everybody <laughs> was uh, walking up the stairs. That is a more radical solution, which I might favor myself, actually. So uh, I think encouraging those, those, those examples are, we still have a long way to go to understand how we're going to achieve dramatic changes in behavior that we will need in the next few decades. And science has yet to create the knowledge base on which to offer policy advice. And perhaps, and I just offer this as a final thought, we should make this, understanding our own future and our own behavior that will contribute to our future, a more immediate priority than spending $2.5 billion putting a vehicle on Mars. Thank you for listening.